How do I sound? Can you hear me? All right, yeah? I'm going to use the comedian's stool. She had the right idea. Becky's funny, funny stuff. I'm going to talk about you in a minute. Nice things, though. Awesome. I had a... Uh, some, I'm stealing the joke, Amber told me this. I had the, uh, an F under my chair, I, so I get to say dirty words tonight. <laughs> and I am going to say dirty words, so if you're uncomfortable with coarse language, earthy talk, salty language, you can wait in the hallway and then we'll chat later, all right? It'll be good. Uh, lots of great stuff, and I also loved the picture of the limbic system, because some of the stuff we're talking about tonight has to do with that little emotional hit that you get when you hear dirty words. I prefer to call it taboo language. Taboo language is the kind of stuff that you aren't allowed to say because it could offend somebody. Sometimes it offends them because it's about them or because you're playing a little power game, right? Sometimes taboo language is about you and not them. It's just the stuff that you're not allowed to say. Four letter words, dirty words, coarse talk, that sort of thing. I've got notes. I've got notes tonight because I have a lot of data. I'm going to do a big data dump on you. I tend to talk very fast. Not as fast as the guy from Bloomington, but close. And I'm not as good and not as funny. If you were drunk, this would be great. <laughs> I did a Pecha Kucha night last year about this kind of thing. And I, I killed. It was, you would have loved it. It was great. It was a great set. They were completely shit-faced. It was like <laughs> they were seven drinks in by the time I got up. There's a story that Abraham Lincoln used to tell about Colonel Fisk. Colonel Fisk was uh, in charge of a regiment, and he decided that the coarse language among his troops wouldn't be allowed. And so he passed this rule and said, look, I am the only one who is allowed to curse and swear. Nobody else. And so a few months passed, and things went well, and Colonel Fisk got word that one of his men had cursed. They'd been traveling down a road. Uh, axles were breaking, potholes and mud, and the oxen weren't doing what they were supposed to do, and the artillery wasn't getting where it needed to go. And so Colonel Fisk called this guy in for addressing down and said, didn't you know that I'm the only one that's supposed to curse and swear? And the man said, yeah, but you weren't there to do it. <laughs> so I had to do it. And so tonight, it's my job to do a little bit of that. I'm talking about taboo language. I, you know, I had something happen last week that kind of changed a little bit of what I want to talk about here today. I was originally going to address uh, things like the N-word. Uh, I, I spoke to an interracial communications class last week at a college campus in New York. Um, about 30 people, circle of chairs, professor on the side, I'm standing there, we're talking about it. And I decided to open with a question. Would you authorize me as an expert on language to use the N-word as we talk about the N-word? And I was kind of surprised that almost everyone in the room said no. So we couldn't even begin the conversation because I couldn't use the word to talk about the word. And so I said, well, well let me just ask the women, can I use the C word to talk about the C word? And a few more said yes, but pretty much that was off the limits, off limits too. And then I said, well, what about the F word? Can I say fuck? And, there, and there, more of them would allow that. And I had an African American woman on the side, she said, well, you know, I don't, that's all fine, but the B word is the one that gets me. I'm like, the, the B word, I don't, I don't even know the B word. The bitch was the word that she meant. That was her word, that was her fire word. That was the one that just set her our eyes to go aflame, and she would just tear ass on you if you used the word on her or her people. She, she really, she, you could just see her, she was sitting up straight in her chair as she said it too. Um, this is what taboo language does to us, it's got this power, and part of the power that it has is because we can't talk about it. We are embarrassed. Mama said not to, daddy said don't. We got our mouths washed out with soap at some point, right? As you heard in the introduction, one of the things that I do is a radio show called Way With Words. We're on across the country, 25 states, a lot of stations. Um, Sundays at 3, 89.5 KPBS. <laughs> and the thing about this show is that we have a mission, which is to change the way that America talks and thinks about language. And it's not just the line, we actually do it. I've got, I can give this speech for four hours and tell you a thousand examples of how we've changed people's minds. But the one thing I can't talk about on the air is taboo language. So that's what I like to talk about when I talk to people face to face. I'm ac I actually work very blue. You know, I had a conversation, I'm looking at her because she's the comedian, she's in a great spot. I can actually see her. I had a conversation with a female comedian last night, and she and I were talking about this. She's like, yeah, you've got to decide how blue you're going to work. To work blue means how much language you're going to use that other people might be uncomfortable with. Will you say fuck? 
Will you talk about sex acts? Will you talk about race? Are you going to talk about things that make other people uncomfortable? Is it stuff that your parents or your grandparents might not want to hear? It's just you've got to pick where on the spectrum you're going to work. And she said, I've, I've chose, I found my place. I get some gigs. But she says, you know, once they hear you use the F word, just once you drop the F bomb, you've always got to explain yourself forever after. It's on YouTube. Somebody wrote a review. Uh, they came and saw you because they wanted to hire you for a gig. And it, it, it's this, this thing, even in the one group of people in all of America, actually, basically the English-speaking world, the only group of people who are talking honestly about language are the comedians. I mean, Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Chris Frock, they all talk to me. They're the only people telling the truth, and it's kind of get a laugh. But really, they're telling a little bit of truth. I've got a different angle. I come at it from the linguistics perspective. I've got data. If you've ever want to be bored out of your mind, those are the magic words. I've got data. Let's party. <laughs> Seriously, man. I, I, any dead room, it's bored, I take your party right over. Just talk about vowel shifts. We're all, we're all set. Vowel mergers. <laughs> You never know who I'm going home with. <laughs> My wife. So I started talking with folks about this. I put a survey up on my brand new website last week. You've heard a mention of it, the long bleep, longbleep.org. And it's just a simple questionnaire. When did you use your first dirty word? Uh, do you let your kids speak that way? What do you want to know? That was the best question, turns out. What do you want to know about taboo language? They want to know, people want to know absolutely everything because nobody has told them nothing. They don't know jack about taboo language. Oh, yeah, my grandmother was offended. Uh, yeah, there's a thing I wasn't allowed to say. Uh, a staggering number of people, the conversation when they were raised, about the conversation ended with getting their mouths washed out with soap. That was the same for me. I mean, I cursed like a sailor. Seriously, I was 10, year old. uh, 10 years old. I called my brother things that I didn't know what they were. We like to call each other dildo. <laughs> and finally, my mother grew upset. She's like, do you even know what a dildo is? And you do not want to talk to your mother about dildos. <laughs> she's, like, she's like, I'm like, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know. It's a, a condom? I, I didn't know. And so all I did was made sure that I looked up all the words so I could actually use them properly. It's funny, you go to the library of any grade school in America, and if they've got the unabridged, and you open it up to the, uh, the F word, to fuck, it's like, it's, it's blurred, where all these little fingers have been pointing it out to each other. <laughs> and that's how it was in my library, too. And I looked up damn and hell and shit and fuck, and they were all in there. If your dictionary, by the way, doesn't have those words in it, you need to get a bigger dictionary, because you, you need to have those words in there. I'm not even done with my first card. Can I have three hours? <laughs> Parents are hypocrites, though, I got to tell you. My parents cursed. My mother cursed. My mother had this whole thing where it's like, oh, crap, oh, crap. That was her thing. She grew up a Catholic girl in St. Louis, you know. After raising five kids, she moved to the word shit. I thought that was allowed. You raise five kids, you can say whatever you want. But she didn't use the coarse language like my father. There was a, we lived in the country in Missouri for a time, and uh, some friends came down from St. Louis for the weekend. They brought their black lab with them, beautiful dog by the name of Vassar, after the school in, in upstate New York. Actually, not upstate, but you know, Vassar College, small liberal arts college. And the whole weekend, my brother and my sisters and I called that dog Bastard. Here, Bastard, come on, Bastard, come on, come on. We thought that, because that's what my father called things. If a car didn't start, it was a bastard. If you couldn't turn the nut on a machine, it was a bastard or a son of a bitch, right? So my parents cursed. I, I remember when my father first said the word motherfucker. We were, I was 13. He was putting up an antenna, television area, out back the house. He pinched his finger. He's like, motherfucker. And you know what? I didn't giggle. I didn't laugh because at that moment, I understood something incredibly important about language, about taboo language. He was inviting me into the man club. He was nominating me into that group of hairy, sweaty fellas. I was going to be one of the guys. And I, I thought that, I mean, seriously. And he never acknowledged it. I never said a word. You know, I didn't say, oh, huh, dad, motherfucker. <laughs> but I knew, and after that, things were different. Uh, seriously, that was a moment. He apparently had decided somewhere in his brain that 13, in the middle of summer, putting up an antenna in the back of the yard was the time. I mean, I, I just kind of wish I was a Jew, because there's a whole ceremony to become a man. <laughs> 
If you're a white kid in Missouri, it's the word motherfucker, apparently. That's all, you know? There's no Hebrew involved. I didn't have to memorize any part of the Bible. I'm telling you, first card, Jesus, what am I going to do with the rest of this? When my time's up, I'll just stop cold. Um, my, you know, there are families. My, we found a really great crowd when we moved here in San Diego. We've been here a couple of years. I lived in New York City for 16 years, Missouri forever before that, Bay Area for a year. And so my wife found this community of people. They all have kids about my son's age. He's five. More about him in a minute. And there's really differing standards of what they allow their kids to say. Some of these kids can't even say the word fart or butt or crap. Because for them, oh, I see a head nodding here. How many other? Were you forbidden to say butt or crap or fart? I consider those kind of soft taboo, right? I mean, it's gateway porn to the bigger words, right? You start saying fuck, pretty soon after you start saying fart, right? But uh, it's kind of shocking to me because I use fairly coarse language around my son, uh, as you might expect, <laughs> by what you've heard here. My wife is a linguist and lexicographer as well, so we take a fairly reasonable approach, which is if my son starts using this language, we educate him. That's how it works. You know? but, the, but the thing about kids is that they're, you know, there's a period at which they can use the words and not understand it, even if you explain it. They, they'll just hear snatches of conversation and turn it into a little sing-song. So my son one day, when we were still living in Brooklyn, New York, he's like, fuck you ball, fuck you ball, fuck you ball. And my wife and I were like, <laughs> because it's funny. And he didn't know, I mean, we didn't want to encourage it. So we're like, we're like, ducky balls, that's rather funny, son. Very funny, ducky, ducky balls. You know, because you don't want him walking around saying fucky balls in public, really. Because he didn't understand what it was. I never, I never say fucky balls, by the way. That's not one, that's not one of my things. I, he made that up. Kids understand morphology very early. We're a shit and fuck family, not a fart and crap family. I mean, there was a, I mean we kind of draw the line at these words. So you, you know, like, look, fuck is a word that you say you can say at home only in certain circumstances, and even then you probably shouldn't, and don't ever say it around your grandparents or at school or anywhere else. Just go into the closet, shut the door, and tell your, tell your stuffed animals um, if you need to, to say it. Teachers don't talk about it in school, really. I mean, seriously, there's whole big parts of education that are screwed up in this country, and the only one that I care about at this moment in time is the fact that they don't talk to you about taboo language. Who had a conversation? I mean, you get the sex talk, you may have even got it in school, right? But did you have the taboo language talk? Only after you used the word. Nobody said, don't, nobody said, here are the rules about the F word, the S word, the C word, the B word, G, H, Z, L, P word, right? And don't break these, so you'll be in trouble. No, they let you break it, and then they busted your ass, or washed your mouth out with soap. They used, they used Dawn dish detergent for me. Oh, I, I, won't, I won't buy it. I have a long-standing ban on Procter & Gamble products in my house now. I, w I will not. Nasty. It's like poison. There's a joke that I want to tell. Maybe you've heard this. If you have, please laugh loudly. There's a kid comes home from school with a note for his parents. It says, Dear parents, your son's swearing is unacceptable. Kid goes back to school. Next day, he comes home with another note for his parents from his teacher. Dear parents, it was even worse today. Please teach him better. Kid goes back to school with a letter from his parents. Dear teacher, we've been trying to improve his swearing at home, and he's been practicing, but we'll be damned if we can do anything about it. <laughs> there are just some families that are cursing families, and that's something that some people don't understand. You have to have this conversation before you get to realize that it is a massive distance between what some families will allow and some families will not. And it's not necessarily based on culture or race or religion or education. The religion one surprises a lot of people. You'd actually find that the correlation between what is allowed and not allowed does not align very well with religion. And actually what's really interesting about it is the least cursing happens in the middle of the socioeconomic curve. It's tied into strivers and people with ambition. You think when you're on their way up that at the top above you, the next level, they're better than you. They speak differently than you do. They sound smarter. They sound more educated. Therefore, they do not curse. So you think on the way up, if you would have just adopt a few of the trappings of the people on the next level, maybe you should just stop cursing. It turns out that the people at the top are some of the worst and the people at the bottom. The ones in the middle, the strivers, they're the ones who curse the least. Isn't that interesting? And you, half of you don't even believe me. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true, though. 
I mean, you know, when you first hear, I love it when you first hear somebody curse, like, uh, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend, somebody like that. It's kind of like you're seeing how they look in sweatpants for the weekend, right? <laughs> it's like the true self coming out. Oh, I see, you're a motherfucker kind of person, right? In your house, they say motherfucker. Oh, in my house, it's sons of bitch. Oh, very nice, you sons of bitch. Um, I learned fuck on the bus on the way to kindergarten. I probably, it feels like the first, in my memory, it's the first day. And I remember the kids in the back. These are the same kids that when they were in high school were back there like selling pot to each other. It's always the same sort of kid. Um, I didn't know what the words meant, true, but I, I eventually got such a vocabulary, they washed my mouth out with soap, it all went underground, and then I kept this kind of language in my life until I had a kid of my own. And you get a kid of your own, and I know some of you are in college, you'll have kids, you'll forget this until you have your kid, and then you'll remember how smart I was and how prescient, okay? But I'm just telling you, when you get your kid, your language will change. Because not, just, not only does he walk around saying fucky balls, but he's learning to categorize these words. I like stubbed my toe and said, fuck. You know, it's like one of those like toe jammers and the toe turned purple. That, and he's behind me going, he's going, shit. Because he'd learned to categorize these words. He put, I got a minute. He put them all together. I'm gonna go down to the end of my deck. And I'm gonna, t I'm gonna I love this. I got 52 of these. It's like strip poker with dirty words. Here's the main point that I got today. We've got to talk about this stuff. At the bottom of this taboo language is part of our uncomfortableness with talking about race, ethnicity, religion, class, and education. These words that we're so just easily ignoring because they embarrass us, they're uncomfortable, they're the kind of language that, it, oh, you just can't talk about it. There's a trick in there. There's a passageway in there into the answers to these other problems. You solve the problem with these words. If you begin to understand these, then you begin to understand race. You begin to understand ethnicity, politics, religion, society, government. It all comes down to understanding the power contained within these dirty words. Thank you. <laughs>